morning, everyone. Now, with all these lights, we can't see you, but we need to hear you. So good morning, everyone. That's better. Okay, so you're there. That's great. Uh, well, it's Wednesday morning. It's the middle day of the summit. I'm Sandy Roger, the Chief Operations Officer of the Toilet Board. I'm going to guide you through this first part of the day. And uh, we have a day with a theme, sanitation as a solution provider. Okay, so this day has a theme. We're going to build around that theme all day. I'm going to explain the theme uh, in just a moment. But let me start by introducing the panel that we have on the stage for this, for this session. Um, oh, we've got some photos going on here. Yeah. Um, Paramaswaran uh, Iyer is the Secretary at the Ministry of Drinking Water and Sanitation in, in the Indian government. He's been at the helm of the Swatch Bharat mission, which I'm sure we've all heard of, which has been the most astonishing transformation of sanitation in India, probably the most astonishing transformation of sanitation anywhere. Um, and he's now leading the next phase of strategy with the Indian government, which he's going to talk to us about in a moment. He's become a huge supporter of the toilet board. Uh, I, we seem to find a lot of common ground around the market-based approaches, which, which are integral really to the sanitation economy. So, Secretary, I welcome uh, this morning. Uh, Desigan Naidu is, is the Chief Executive of the Water Research Commission in South Africa. And um, again, the, the Water Research Commission has been a, a, a good friend of the Toilet Board for a number of years. We, we have them on our Partnership Council. I published a paper with them um, this summer together. And as we go forward into 2020 with ambitions of new activity in Africa, um, WRC are very much central to the development of those plans. So, yes, again, welcome to you. Peter Harvey from UNICEF, another Partnership Council member organization. Um, Peter heads up the, the, the educational division within, within UNICEF, which really looks after WASH programs right across the world. I think it's more than 100 countries around the world that you're, you're working with, uh, including um, some of that is corporate programs. And, that, and that's the area that we're going to talk about particularly in, in this morning's um, session, but truly a global view of water and sanitation from, from Peter. So that's the, the first panel. We, we have a, a set of panels for you this morning. Now, um, a, a word on Secretary Iyer's visit with us this morning. Um, we uh, have been, been working with Secretary Iyer and his team over the last few months to create a workshop looking at government engagement in sanitation, public-private uh, partnerships and so forth. That workshop is taking place today, so we're delighted that that's come to fruition. Um, that's one of the optional workshops after the morning break. Um, uh, unfortunately, such is Secretary Iyer's demanding schedule back in Delhi that he's only with us for the first part of the day. And so instead of him ad addressing and attending that workshop, um, he's actually going to make a short address to us here uh, in the main room. So there's a slight change to the schedule this morning in that we will have um, the, the, the first panel and then Secretary Iyer's address. And then Secretary will leave with Cheryl to go and look at the, uh, the marketplace outside. Um, if you're interested in market-based approaches, then of course you're interested in the actual market of solutions that are available. And so we're going to take Secretary out to look at that and we'll carry on with the sessions here in the main room. Okay, so that explains both for these gentlemen and for everyone else the kind of logistics of what we're doing. Hopefully that, that makes sense to all of you. So um, let's talk again about this idea of sanitation as a solution provider. Now, um, some of you may be thinking, well, this is obvious. Uh, sanitation or the lack of sanitation is the problem. The provision of sanitation is the solution. That's it. Well, of course, that's true, but that's not what we're talking about today. Right? So if, if, if that surprises you, listen up, because this is something a little bit different. So what we have um, with the sanitation economy is what people call a, a, a process of systemic change. So, so this is about finding root causes to, solution, to, to problems rather than just curing the symptoms. It's not about just going around building sanitation facilities. It's about fundamentally realigning the resource flows in the economy, the flows of nutrients, flows of water, energy, data, and finance. So it's a systemic approach. And one of the things that tends to happen with systemic approaches is that you kind of smooth out the wrinkles in the wider system of, 
of what's happening around us in the economy. And so you find that you have wider benefits than you might expect. And the result of that is that it turns out that the sanitation economy is really good for um, a number of other areas which are really big priorities for people. The slide doesn't seem to be moving, guys. Um, okay, sorry, we're, we're, on, we're on that one. Okay, so it turns out that, that the sanitation economy has a wider impact than we expect. It turns out that it's really good for climate change. It turns out that it's really good for water. It turns out that it's really good for sustainable agriculture and food supply. It helps smart cities. It helps women's health and empowerment. And of course, it helps health generally. But with this preventative health opportunity that we began to talk about at the Smart City yesterday, um, and it may even help in part with the problems of plastic waste. Now, okay, so it helps all these things. Is that just a kind of intellectual curiosity, a nice side effect? Well, no, we believe it's more important than that. Because if you have a government, as we have in India, who's facing huge challenges with water, and sanitation isn't just a valuable thing in itself, but he's helping with the water crisis, then it will get higher priority. If a country faces the impact of climate change, as South Africa does, and sanitation can help with climate change, then sanitation will get a higher priority. If corporate uh, engagement with, with WASH suddenly is motivated by the fact that this is helping a company who's prioritized on water or women's empowerment or what, whatever of these priorities it is, sanitation gets more priority. So instead of having sanitation getting this much support from the people that prioritize it as number one, suddenly we get all the climate change people and all the water people and all the women's empowerment people and all the smart city people and, 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 and many more people will want to do sanitation. So this is about broadening the impact, broadening the business case, broadening the resources and investment that go into sanitation. So it's really important for us sanitation folk to reach out and see if we can achieve this broader agenda. So that's what sanitation as a solution provider means. It's not just providing sanitation, it's all about this wider benefit. Okay, so that's just to explain, and we're gonna work into the subject as we go through the, through the day. So let me start with the, the, the panel here. Now, Secretary Iyer, to, to, to start with you. Um, you know, earlier this year, there was the election, the, the new, uh, the new government took its place, the ministry has been restructured, and you made this extraordinary declaration of ODF free after, uh, you know, what is it, 100 million toilets have been built, the most extraordinary process. But now um, the new mission has been announced, which is about, you know, pipe drinking water supply. And, and I suppose to the uninformed, there might be a sense that the Indian government has sort of finished with sanitation and is now doing water instead. But I, th I, I, I think from what we understand, that's not the story. It's much more joined up than that. So can you, can you tell us how you see sanitation as part of a water agenda as well? Sure. No, uh, like you mentioned, you know, sanitation is still very much on the agenda. Uh, one milestone, in a sense, has been achieved. And uh, you know, the state governments, the districts, the villages have declared themselves open defecation free. But everyone recognizes that uh, the work on sanitation very much needs to go on. And in fact, uh, the main challenge now, which all of us are working on, is sustaining all the outcomes of open defecation free. So there's a whole uh, mission going on at the moment, which, so we moved from ODF to ODF plus. And the first plank in ODF plus is sustaining the gains of open defecation free. So this is all about continuing the behavior change communication, the capacity strengthening all the way down to the grassroots level, uh, the institutional and financial incentives for villages and districts and states to remain open defecation free. So this is going to continue. You know, one of the, the gurus of behavioral change economics, uh, Taylor and Sunstein. So Sunstein was in India a couple of months ago. And he, uh, when we asked him, how long does it take to really make the change behavior stick and sustain itself? He felt it would take two to three years. So uh, the message is very clear. The Prime Minister has, has made this very clear that the work on sanitation continues. 
we need to continue to focus on the behavior change, on the usage of toilets. So that's very much a focus and sanitation continues. Having said that, we're also looking at a broader definition of sanitation, which is part of the ODF Plus agenda. It's also about solid and liquid waste management. And uh, there are four elements in this. In solid waste, we're looking at organic waste management as well as plastic waste management. And for liquid waste, we're looking at grey water, which is uh, going to converge with the new drinking water mission. That is the wastewater coming out of the kitchen and bathing uh, from drinking water. And then, of course, black water management or fecal sludge management, which I know is a topic of some interest here and elsewhere, is how do you get into more decentralized systems, the evacuation of septic tanks, and how do you treat that effectively? So that's on the, on the sanitation agenda. But also, uh, as you mentioned, uh, the Prime Minister made another big announcement uh, during his 15th August Red Fort Independence Day speech, the first speech of his second tenure, and another big, bold idea, very much like his first uh, announcement in his first term, where he announced the Swaj Bharat mission. This time he spoke about the Jal Jeevan mission which literally translated stands for the Water Life Mission. Now, this is uh, about providing tap water, pipe water supply in every rural household over the next five years. It's a very, very big challenge, probably even bigger and more complex than the sanitation challenge because uh, we need to provide tap water, tap water to about 150 million households in rural India. Today, the coverage of tap water in rural households is only about 18%. So the, the challenge is to go from 18% to 100%, that's about 150 million households in just five years. And of course, uh, drinking water has got challenges which are even more complex than sanitation. We're looking at groundwater source sustainability, we're looking at the reuse, and again, that's going to be an important convergence with sanitation. The reuse of grey water to make sure we can treat it at a low cost and use it for recharge of groundwater or even for agriculture or for industrial purposes. Now, again, having tap water in the house is also going to improve and enhance the sustainability of the toilet program. While currently we don't see uh, the lack of water as a major challenge for sustaining sanitation, because the model which is used in rural India is the twin pit leach pit model and the pan requires only about a litre and a half to flush. It's the steep slope pan and I know a couple of manufacturers here have come up with even more efficient pans uh, where you need even less water to flush. But of course it makes it easier and it's less of a hassle for the householder, typically the lady of the house who has to fetch the bucket of water so if you have tap water it makes it easy. So, Water very much on the agenda, and uh, I'm very interested to hear about the deliberations here. Okay. Thank, you. thank you very much. So let, let's thank you. Let, let's fly across the Indian Ocean to South Africa, uh, and and there we find another country with water challenges, and in particular, um, water challenges driven by climate change. And um, you know we've heard of the stories of droughts and so forth. There's a saying that. If climate change is the beast, water is the teeth. In other words, where does climate change bite? It bites through water issues of various kinds. So, so Desigan Naidu, do you, do you want to tell us a little bit about the South African situation, what's happening with climate change and water, and where sanitation fits into the solution to that problem? Uh, certainly. Good morning, everyone. Um, let, let's start in the other direction because it started in South Africa. Okay. <laughs> And let me expand on that a little bit. For a while, uh, Mr. Ayer, we thought we were the world champions because in 1994, when we inherited that country as a democracy, we were at 58% coverage with sanitation. And by 2008, we managed to get to 95%, which is quite an achievement. And then along came India and Prime Minister Modi and yourself. And you went in 2014 from 39% to now 98%, uh, according to your numbers, and the quantum is taking 600 million people out of open defecation, so we have to hand over the trophies. Uh, 
But, but as the 30th driest country in the world, we have to be innovative all of the time. And one of the things that uh, we espouse in the Water Research Commission, which is where I'm from, is the concept of the multiplier effect. Every investment we make must have a multiplier effect. And new sanitation has an incredible promise. The promise of new sanitation, in particular non sewage sanitation, and we must talk a lot more about that, is that we're looking at the kind of solution that, on the one hand, will save a lot of water. We're talking about 30 plus percent per household in water saving from non-flush mechanisms. But more than that, it's a low energy solution. Low energy on the one hand, and low energy meaning low carbon. Low carbon meaning we have a contribution towards lowering the impacts of climate change and contributing to a green economy, which is fantastic. But in addition to that, we have the kinds of solutions that are allowing us to organize for this new sanitation to in fact become part of the energy solution for ourselves as well. And we're talking about the possibility of the conversion of the products of sanitation into energy to supplement the grid. So this kind of composite solution is the kind of environment that we're looking at. And this multiplier effect goes way beyond sanitation. So we're talking about a very real possibility in the not too distant future around organizing sanitation. Is this the wrong one? Ah, there I am. Okay, uh, I, I hope you didn't miss too much of what I said before. So, so we're looking at, at new sanitation, not only organizing to have a dignified, hygienic service for people, but actually being a stimulant for something a lot bigger, in part engaging the issues of water, in part engaging the issues of climate change, but even more than that, becoming a test bed for actually developing a new industrial economy. And this would be absolutely wonderful. And I think the kinds of changes that are demanded by this or must be done in very particular ways. And one of the ways that we're very keen on is organizing for an inclusive way in which we engage. Because for far too long have these kinds of systems run out of the center. It's now time to bring the people into this picture and build a new solution together. Great, thank you very much. So the, the microphone passes to, to Peter. And, you know, Peter, we've, we've talked so far about, about countries. And let, let's let's switch and talk about companies. And and through programs like Wash for Work, you know, you, you're working with a whole number of companies who have priorities, sanitation, and, and other priorities. So, um, you know, how how can this solution a provider approach enhance corporate engagement around programs like Wash for Work? Yeah, thanks very much. I, I think with the SDG 6.2 challenge, it's just huge. I mean, we're talking about hundreds of millions of toilets required just to get us to a level of basic sanitation um, and even more if we're going to safely manage sanitation. We, UNICEF in the past has supported governments uh, very much on the demand creation side of sanitation as well as the informal private sector. Um, where we haven't engaged so much is with, with the formal private sector, both at country level and also uh, regional and global level. Uh, last year we, we launched our sanitation market shaping strategy. Um, which is really trying to uh, encourage private sector engagement in sanitation. Um, and, and we've undertaken market assessments in a number of different countries, in Sub-Saharan Africa and, and South Asia and Southeast Asia. And, and after the market assessments, which are looking at barriers and opportunities in the market for, for sanitation, we then hold industry consultations where we bring together different players within the private sector as well as development partners and government and see what opportunities there are for private sector to, to engage. Um, and one, sometimes it's quite difficult to communicate what the opportunities are and I think we've seen a lot of the work that the Toilet Board Coalition has been doing that around sanitation as a, a solution provider. And, and getting people to shift from more of a, a philanthropy view at times to to more of a service, uh, sustainable service view, can be quite a challenge. Um, but we are finding through these consultations that we are seeing more opportunities for, for private sector engagement. And, and looking beyond, yes, we need to provide hundreds of millions of toilets, as I say, but we also need to provide the associated services. And of course, if we can get value from, from those toilets and services, then we've got much more chance of moving ahead. We need to, we need to think out of the box, and I think that's why we're here um, at, this, at this summit. In terms of wash for work, I mean, partnerships are key, both with development partners and the private sector. 
Um, and Wash for Work is an initiative which is to, to mobilise businesses to uh, provide wash services both in the workplace for their workforces, um, across supply chains that they deal with and also um, for the communities in which their workers live. And, and we're trying through the Wash for Work initiative with, with other partners to, to get businesses to see the return on investment. A happy workforce it means more productivity and, and really make the business case for, for WASH, both, as I say, within the workplace and also within the communities. Um, the World Business Council for Sustainable Development, we heard from yesterday, um, they have a, a WASH for Work pledge, uh, which over 50 companies have signed, um, which I think is, is a great start. We can go a lot, a lot further than that. Um, in terms of UNICEF's involvement in that, I think we see there are many advantages for women and children, um, both in terms of the workplace, um, in terms of breastfeeding for young children, making that more, um, more work-friendly environments for, for breastfeeding, for menstrual hygiene, um, health and hygiene, for uh, early childhood development. Also, as the custodians of, with WHO of the Joint Monitoring Programme for Water and Sanitation, we have the figures and, and all the data that we can really use to, to, to get the focus from businesses and, and show the scale of the problem and what we need to address. Thank you. Peter, thank, thanks very much. So, so we, we're, we're seeing this more joined up picture emerging from, from all three speakers, each in the different context that they're, they're working with. Um, let's go around one more time, gentlemen, because you know, the, the reality is this, is this is not easy to do, right? Joining up disciplines across what may have been silos in, in whether it's government departments or professional education or, or, or whatever it is. The yuck factor kicks in. You know, there are lots of people who we might want to engage about sanitation who don't particularly want to be in that conversation. You know, it's not an easy conversation to have with the food industry, for example. So this is not necessarily an easy thing to do. And, and so what I'd like to hear from each of you is what are the, what are the success factors? What, what needs to be true for us to be able to move forward and, and make progress with the agendas that you've described? You, you know, give us one or two key success factors for this. Secretary Ayer. Yeah, you know, uh, some of it is going to figure in my brief presentation. I think, look, clearly in India, uh, success, the, success, the success factor for the Swaj Bharat mission or for sanitation in general is the first of our four Ps, which is political leadership. You know, we had our Prime Minister uh, who spoke about toilets, the indignity of women and girls from uh, the Red Fort at his Independence Day speech. So that made a very big difference. In fact, all the difference. Uh, I remember when I was uh, working in Vietnam and uh, I can see uh, Maria Angelica here from the Hi, Maria Angelica. We, we had gone on a trip together to Hanoi uh, to look at the scope of sanitation in Vietnam. And politically, there was no traction. You know, at that time, I'm talking maybe uh, six, seven years ago, where even the word defecation was not acceptable, you know, in, to be spoken about. So here, to get our Prime Minister to talk about it and to follow through made a big difference. The second P is public financing. You know, if you really want to grow the market, you need to have an effective public financing system. In India, the government put its money where its mouth was. So over $20 billion were committed by center and states for uh, the Swaj Bharat mission. The third, of course, is partnerships, you know, with organizations such as yourself, bringing in the private sector, because now increasingly as we move into the next phase of Swaj Bharat, I think it's going to be very important to have good business models, local entrepreneurs, keeping this thing sustainable and some people making a living out of it. So I think that's going to be important. And finally, it's people's participation. All that communication, the outreach, getting people to own the program, to take pride in it, uh, in, in northern India, the term for a toilet is Izzat Ghar. Izzat Ghar means, you know, it's a house of pride. So they take pride in their toilets, and I think that also made a big difference. Great. Okay. Des again, what, what are the success factors for you? Uh, well, I endorse all of those. That, that's brilliant. Uh, the thing that I would add to it is that I think key is, is revisualizing the narrative. And the narrative has been primarily about public service. It's been primarily about dealing with the poor. But the revisualization of this narrative goes in other directions. I mean, we talked 
a little bit just now about climate change and the environmental justice component that is attainable through this. The second thing that we have spoken about is organizing for people to have a dignified service, a hygienic service, and this, if you like, moves towards uh, social justice. The third is that there's a lot of money to be made in sanitation. It's, it has the possibility, and, 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 and some folk, uh, myself included, have been talking about the concept of a sanitation unicorn. And Cheryl joined us at our symposium earlier this year where we were pushing this quite strongly, that you can develop large and very successful businesses out of new sanitation, but you need to do it in an inclusive manner. And some of the work that we've done back home around, for example, social franchising as a model, for poor folk in rural communities to become active industrialists in their own right talks to the economic justice. So you have social justice, environmental justice, and economic justice. And if you excuse the pun, this becomes the basis for the sanitation new triple bottom line. Fantastic. So we've got three Ps. We've got the triple bottom line. Peter, have you got three things uh, for I'm us I'm as well? I'm not sure I can <laughs> really follow that. but. Uh, I mean, I, I would echo the same the same points in terms of we need we do need public finance uh, as part of the, the picture, and, and we need a combination of public financing and, and private sector investment, um, especially as the lower quintiles, as you mentioned, social franchising models, etc. I think, but we also need to be bold and we need to operate at scale. As I, as I mentioned before, we you know we need to move much faster than we have been moving, and we're not going to do that by by dealing with. Um, yeah, small, small companies moving slowly, small pilots, etc. So we really need to operate at scale and be bold enough to do that. And, and partnerships, as I mentioned before, are key. And I think, of course, there are conventional partnerships and we all need to, to work together, but also uh, looking at the usual suspects and the unusual suspects. Um, and, and that's what we've really tried to do through some of the industry consultations, bring in some of the private sector that wouldn't normally engage in sanitation at all. Um, in fact, at first would even wonder why you're talking to them about sanitation. Um, but if we can communicate in the right way and really get the message and the opportunities across, then I think we can move a long way. Fantastic. Okay, well, thank, thank you for those answers. We, we, we could continue. These, these three gentlemen know so much about the, the subject and, and can inspire us all, hopefully, through the day ahead. Peter and, and Des, again, hopefully you're staying with us and, and, and the many other questions that we could ask, let's ask them as, while, while they're here. But let's turn to, to Secretary Iyer. Would, would you like to join us and, and make your address? And then we'll hear a little bit more about the Indian government. Thank you very much. Can I have your presentation? First of all, thank you very much and good morning to all of you. I was very impressed when I told Cheryl that you're starting at 8.30 in the morning in India. That's great, and to see a, almost a full hall, although Cheryl told me that most of you are captive in this hotel anyway, so. But uh, no, I'm an early morning person myself. I went out on a field trip with uh, the chief executive officer of the Zilla Panchayat, and we went out to look at uh, sanitation and water in, in suburban Pune. But uh, again, and apologies for disrupting your schedule. We, we did a bit of disruption in the ministry when I joined, but. Uh, didn't want to do it here. Parliament is in session in Delhi and my minister is just back from a trip to Israel and we have to discuss his uh, answer to the start question tomorrow morning. So I have to go and brief him, so I have to leave early. But uh, let me just briefly, uh, we have touched upon many of the topics. Thank you for raising them. So I'm going to uh, talk a little bit about sanitation and about the water agenda going forward. Can we have the next slide, please? So this is broadly uh, the agenda as it was and as it is and going forward. The Swaj Bharat mission, which is uh, Clean India mission. And then we are now moving from ODF as open defecation free to ODF plus, uh, which I spoke about. And then there's the new uh, drinking water mission in rural India. And the Jal Shakti Abhiyan is an interesting one. It complements the drinking water mission. This is about water conservation which is going to be very, very important going forward. And for some of us who have been around for a long time in the rural drinking water and sanitation uh, arena, 
we really didn't focus on water conservation too much in the past, but now going forward, whether it's because of climate change or groundwater depletion, it's critical to complement drinking water and, and have it going together with water conservation. So that's another uh, campaign which is going on called the Jal Shakti Abhiyan. And uh, I think importantly, institutionally, and from a policy perspective, this is the first time in India, and perhaps you know uh, one of the few instances globally as well, where uh, two ministries were integrated to bring to start looking at water in an integrated manner. So uh, my ministry was the Ministry of Drinking Water and Sanitation, and that joined up with the Ministry of Water Resources, and we are now the Ministry of Jal Shakti. So. Uh, Two ministries have come together. More needs to be done, but this is the first step towards integration of water. Next. Next, please. So, again, uh, we spoke about this briefly. In sanitation, uh, with India contributing about 60% of the world's open defecation in 2014, this was a big challenge for India, but also globally. Can we go to the next? So, when you're doing in demand but not an obvious demand it becomes more challenging because you're trying to stimulate demand and that's about behavior change and again at scale so then and then you're bringing in the supply whether it's coming in from the private sector or from the public sector so you're stimulating demand you're crowding in the supply chain so that dive becomes much more complicated so it was quite difficult when we had to do all this and to make it even more difficult when you're trying to change the behavior of 550 million people becomes even more difficult. So that was the context when we started this program. Next, please. Now, this is the dashboard which we have. And uh, on the left side, that's the map of India. This is rural Swaj Bharat. Uh, it looked like that on the left. Uh, you can see it is quite patchy. There were a few states which were doing better than others. And uh, on the right is 100%. Of course, there will be gaps. Uh, it's a dynamic situation. We need to plug the gaps. We need to make sure no one is left behind. But at a particular point of time, 2nd October 2019, which was the 150th birth anniversary of Mahatma Gandhi, we referred to Gandhiji in South Africa. You can see, so the scale, 600,000 villages, 700 districts, uh, and so on. And we have uh, data. We were talking to Cheryl in the morning about data. So we've got a database, it's in the public domain of 180 million households. These are names of people. The toilets have been geotagged. Uh, we have a verification system. And one question everyone asks me, is it really open defecation free? And how can it be? And the answer is, look, it's a dynamic situation. There are gaps. There will be gaps. States work on them. They've put out advertisements saying, if anyone has been left behind, put up your hand and you'll get the toilet. So uh, I think that's the reality of the situation. But there's been a huge shift in behavior. And all the, the large-scale uh, verification surveys we have done have shown a very high degree of usage. So we're confident that this program is working. Of course, we need to continue to make sure that that behavior change sticks. Next, please. Now, again, it is important to mention this, you know, it, it's, I don't know whether it's a contradiction of the policy of implementation, but this government, one of the, the USPs of uh, the Narendra Modi government in its first five years was actually delivering down to the last mile. So uh, whether it's cooking gas or toilets or roads or housing, uh, I think the focus was on delivery and not just, uh, so the policy was how do we deliver in mission mode? And uh, you can see from this, can we just click again? These are the four P's I spoke about, so I'm not going to repeat them, but political leadership, the first of the four P's, that's the Prime Minister uh, you know, speaking from the Red Fort. Next, please. And then, of course, the public financing. But now we need to crowd in the private financing as well. So, right? so they need to go together, as Peter mentioned. Next. And this is about the partnerships, whether it's development partners or the private sector or NGOs. Again, it's a critical, it's not just a government program. And, and finally, people's participation. So how people took up this program, how women led the program, how school children participated. Next, please. So again, this is uh, 
the Prime Minister of India who took a big risk in announcing this program, but then put all his weight behind it. Next, please. So you can see here, in terms of public financing, these are the different elements. So rural, urban, you can see the big numbers there. Uh, other departments and other programs. So a lot of convergence took place. The MNRGA is the Mahatma Gandhi National Rural Employment Guarantee Program, uh, which is essentially providing wage employment in rural India. But a lot of those funds also went into provision of toilets. The corporate sector, uh, there's a Swaj Bharat Kosh, which is a, like a trust in the finance ministry, which received a lot of corporate funding for sanitation. The corporates have also invested in their own domains. And a lot of user financing, and even more importantly going forward, is credit financing. And we see this, I can see uh, Vedika here from, <coughs> who has done tremendous work on promoting uh, borrowing for water and sanitation. I think increasingly going forward, that's going to be very important at the micro level. And it also leads to much greater sustainability. So this, there's a big market for it. You must have heard from Vedika. And that's something we would like to tap into. So the Toilet Board Coalition, it, it says 62 billion is the market. Pune alone is what, 52 million? Billion, I don't know, this, uh, whether it's billion or million. So there's a huge market out there. And I think going forward, this whole public-private partnership is going to be very, very important. Uh, the government's interested in it, not just for the money, but for sustaining this program. So uh, all the ideas, all the business models, and I focus more on rural India, but we are really keen to see local entrepreneurs in both water and sanitation who can earn a living out of it, create jobs, but provide services as well. Next, please. So these are some of the partnerships which uh, took place under the Swaj Bharat mission. Uh, with the media, we had all kinds of campaigns, uh, mass communication running, with development partners like UNICEF, the bank, uh, the Tata Trust, WaterAid, the Gates Foundation. And of course, uh, Tata Trust, now they're not exactly, they're a, they're a non-profit. Phenomenal support to us. They gave us young professionals. We had one young professional in every district in India made a huge difference. And of course, working with other government departments. Next, please. So, you know, part of the uh, success of this program was the whole communication campaign. And uh, on the left, you can see, actually somewhere in Pune itself, in this district, we got the, the Comptroller and Auditor General of India, the Controller and Auditor General, to demonstrate the use of the Twin Pit model which is the preferred model in rural India. So he's emptying a pit of human compost which has dried up and can be used as fertilizer. The Prime Minister in his radio address, 70% of his radio addresses had uh, sanitation mentioned. That gave it a big boost. Then uh, we do a bit of social media as well. And of course, uh, movies, Bollywood. Toilet Ek Prem Katha, Akshay Kumar made this movie, became a good friend and does a lot of work for the sector. Next, please. Now, many people ask us, how do you deal with scale? Because uh, this was one of the big challenges we faced. Scale, speed, scale. So we found that the only way you can really deal with scale is with scale. So you can see this is the array of uh, people involved in Team Swaj Bharat. 120 million school students, 1 million masons, many of them women, uh, Swachagrahis are our grassroots motivators who have been trained in community approaches to sanitation, one in every village. Locally elected uh, village leaders called Sarpanchas, the art district collectors who really are the chief executive officers at that level. These are the young professionals, the 500 Zilla Prairaks who came to us from the Tata Trust. Our brand ambassadors, many of them Bollywood uh, and sports superstars. And of course, we were very lucky to have one communicator in chief, which were who was our prime minister. Next, please. Uh, so very quickly, you know, uh, a lot of studies done for us, many by UNICEF and other development partners, really to show the broader impact of sanitation, going well beyond uh, the provision of a toilet and, you know, uh, sort of protecting the dignity and security of women and girls. It creates jobs, you know, and all this might be useful. So this was a study done by UNICEF for us. 7.5 million jobs. It, 
it generates income. So uh, you can see one study where a household in an open defecation free village can save up to 50,000 rupees a year. It's about $720. This program has also helped to protect the environment because uh, excreta in the open contaminates water bodies and the groundwater, improves health of course, and you can see more than 300,000 lives saved according to a World Health Organization study. So much, uh, it's still early uh, days, you know, to look at broader and longer term impacts and outcomes, but we're already seeing results and uh, these studies need to continue to make the case. Next please. Okay, so now we're moving from ODF to ODF plus. We have, this transition has been going on for the last one year or so. And as I mentioned, there are four key elements of the ODF plus agenda, uh, solid and liquid waste. And so now we are moving, this, this is going to be done again over the next five years. And it's, it's very, very complementary with the, with the drinking water mission. Next please. We also, by the way, uh, developed a 10 year strategy just to demonstrate that we're looking ahead in the short and medium term in terms of what is next. Because as someone mentioned, some people thought that you know the sanitation story is over on 2nd October 2019, but not at all. And so we're looking ahead and the next five years are the first milestone in this 10 year strategy. And you can read that report, it's on our website. Next please. Okay, so now we're coming to water and I've got a couple more slides. Uh, what are we doing on water now? Next. Right, so this is uh, the Jal Jeevan mission. And what we have done, at least for India, is we have sort of uh, looking at this, we have changed the paradigm. Instead of looking at, you know, drinking water schemes, uh, you know, the typical engineering approach, where you build schemes and worry about functionality later. For us now, very much like toilets at the household level, we are now looking at a term which is going to become as common as ODF. It is an FHTC, a functional household tap connection. That's, that's going to be the buzzword. So we're looking at uh, 180 million FHTCs. About 40 million are already there. Maybe some of them are not functional actually. And we need to do another 150 million new functional household tap connections. So there's a definition of that. Uh, building on all the work we have done in the bank and elsewhere on the, the program for results. So we have got a definition for the FHTC, uh, minimum supply hours, quality, uh, functionality. And that will be checked through third party verification. So, but this has got four important elements because at least 50% of the schemes will be based on groundwater particularly in the Indo-Gangetic belt where you have adequate uh, water. So in those programs, we need to recharge the groundwater. And earlier, we never really looked at that in the, from the drinking water perspective. So now that's going to be important, whether it's recharge or rainwater harvesting, that will be a mandatory part of those systems. And then of course, the pipe water supply itself will be managed at the lowest appropriate level. If you have uh, groundwater in a particular area, it might be managed locally by the community themselves. And if you don't have adequate groundwater or it's bad quality and you're bringing it from outside, you're transferring it from a reservoir or a dam or a river, then you'll be doing multi-village schemes. There you'll need a higher level uh, formation to manage that. And so there it would depend on what kind of scheme it is. And there we need to look at utility reform. There are different models. In Vietnam, we had the rural utility model so how do we reduce non-revenue water, which traditionally is seen more as an urban thing, but in India, non-revenue water is as high as 50% in most towns and cities. So we need to bring in efficiencies there. And then there's the reuse part, because 70%, at least 70% of all drinking water comes out as gray water. And with a lot of pipe water coming in, we didn't want all the rural areas to be having stagnant water. So the reuse of gray water is going to be mandatory. Uh, with low cost treatments, whether it's community soap pits or simple waste stabilization ponds. How do we treat water at a low cost and then use it for uh, recharge or for even for agriculture? And of course, the operation and maintenance, there is cost recovery, by the way. Uh, communities will contribute to the capital cost and they will also be responsible for operation and maintenance, at least for the in-village distribution systems. If you're doing bulk water transfers, that will probably have to be subsidized. 
And so uh, we want to go from 18% coverage to 100% in five years. Uh, no one said our prime minister doesn't think very big. So uh, that's the challenge he's given all of us. Next, please. And so uh, in terms of water governance and the, the policy uh, context, you can see now that there's been integration. There's a commitment of public finance. If you look at the four Ps, again, the, all we've learned from sanitation. So the prime minister announced that there would be a budget of 3.5 lakh crores, which uh, converted into dollars. How much is that? That's about 50 billion dollars. Uh, and that's just the government share. There's going to be much more invested by the states themselves and probably the, the local governments. Partnerships, you know, the discussion we're having today is a key part of that partnership with the private sector, with development partners. And again, it's very important to make it a people's movement. Now here, the behavior change will probably be a little different. People want clean water. Are they willing to pay for it? Do, will they conserve it? Will they waste it? So behavior change equally important, but in a, uh, to be done in a different way. And so all the experience we've had from the Swaj Bharat mission, we'll need to bring that to bear and we'll need much more support uh, from all of you. Because one thing I learned from uh, Unilever when we did the public-private partnership for hand washing with soap 20 years ago, was that you know if you can sell Coca-Cola in any village in the world, you, you know you can you can market that properly. So we need to learn that, and we learned a lot during Swaj Bharat, and there's much more to learn on changing behavior, stimulating demand uh, from the private sector. So I think that would be another very important contribution. Next. And, and this is the Jal Shakti Abhiyan, this is the water conservation campaign. And you can see this is running in parallel with uh, the drinking water program. And you can see most of the water scares or water stress districts in India are in the western region. You can see all the way down. Those are the red, uh, red colored districts. So that's the focus of this program, but it's going to spread eastwards as we go along and get mainstreamed into a national program. Next, please. Okay, that's it. Thank you very much. And uh, I don't know what the program is. I've got another 15 minutes. I, I think I need to leave. Thank you. Secretary, thank, thank you so much. That was excellent. So, Secretary, I'm going to invite you to join Cheryl and head out to see the, the, the businesses. Um, that was inspiring. And let, let's uh, thank our other two panelists as well. Thanks all, of, all three of you gentlemen.